Okay, so welcome everyone to another installment of our Games and Interactive Media uh, seminar series. Uh, we're doing this now for the fifth time. Uh, my name is Ingmar Riedel Kruse. I'm an assistant professor in bioengineering, and that's uh, a love of mine. And a few other people in the audience who help organizing uh, this. Um, specifically, I want to thank uh, MediaX and, and Martha um, for really uh, supporting uh, this event. Okay, so then it's a pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Steve Sims. So Steve uh, has a master's in computer engineering and he's actually a gaming expert and really has a broad experience in game design, development and production across uh, many different uh, platforms. He has been a distinguished visiting scholar at MediaX and he started out his career uh, actually at Electronic Arts where he was an exec exec executive producer uh, for Madden NFL Football which is one of the number one uh, uh, selling sports video game franchises in North America. Um, he has since then worked in many different companies, so I can't list all of them. Um, currently, he is, he is the chief design officer at Badgeville, which is one of the uh, leading gamification platforms. And there, together with his uh, team, he works on uh, a number of uh, solutions uh, for many different areas, broadly speaking, relating to human motivation. And uh, that's what, I guess, also his talk is about. So um, his uh, talk is titled Human Motivation, Gamification, and secrets to creating successful behavioral programs. So, welcome, Steve. Hi, everybody. Uh, you said that better than I could, so uh, let's keep going. Um, I have a lot of slides, probably too many slides. Um, so I'm gonna go, I'd love this to be interactive. If there's things you wanna know, stop me, or we can keep going. Um, I, I started out in video games, you know, working on, um, on football and a bunch of different things I programmed and then I moved and I, as, as my uh, life went, I got more and more interested in what makes humans do what they do in video games and in life. And so my, my uh, course of journey led me to a uh, connection with uh, Professor Reeves, Byron Reeves over here, who's one of my, my heroes. So, um, you know, when I had the chance to jump at this, I figured, you know, why not? And so thanks to, thanks to Martha, thanks to Byron for letting me speak to you guys. So, um, what I want to talk about for you guys, and this is a little, the deck was made for kind of a mixed audience, so uh, there's a lot of theory, and then I realized that, hey, maybe you want to see some of this stuff in the wild and some use cases, so I, I thought I'd add that in, and we'll, we'll go as fast as I can. So the psychology behind human motivation, how gamification fits in the picture, um, some secrets to designing these things if you want to design systems on your own, and some use cases to show you how it lives in the wild. Um, What's interesting about the history of Badgeville, where I came from after all this game stuff, is there's been a big evolution in this kind of using the psychology and the techniques that occur in uh, loyalty programs and games and basically uh, media interactions and social interactions with people. And it's moved a lot from pure consumer applications. At the beginning of the company, we did a lot of like street teams for Island Def Jam and, and Interscope Records. And uh, we did Samsung's loyalty campaign and TV shows for NBC and things like that. And what's really happened is there's a lot of movement actually into the enterprise. So when you guys are done, depending on what you do with your lives, if you work at bigger companies, you're probably gonna run into things like this. So you're gonna hopefully have a head start in understanding the hows and whys of what you're gonna see. Um, the last thing I would say is that this stuff reaches and touches everything in your life. If, if from how do you get people to work together? How do you get causes when you're raising money? How do you get people to solve diseases together? Um, you know, different things like the Foldit program and, and stuff. All of these things have interactions. Humans are at the center of everything and humans are motivated by behavior. So here we go. All right, why do people do things? Um, again, I am, I am not a, I am a lover of this field of psychology and education and stuff. I'm not an academic, although I wanna be um, at some point in my life, I guess. But um, people, in my world, people do two things. They run away from stuff that scares them and they run towards stuff they love or that are attracted to. Um, Byron would tell you that the response curve to running away from threats is much steeper than those to running rewards because if you make a mistake when you're threatened by something, you will die. Um, you know, basic side thing, it's always freeze, flight, fight, never flat fight or flight. So when you see the squirrel that's doing that, he actually thinks he's making himself invisible so you, so you won't kill him. And um, when you're running towards pleasure, the response curve is actually slower. Um, it's a slower build and so systems that entice you and drag you towards that, 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 that build is what these systems kind of do in some ways. 
Now, a lot of people ask when you're designing for either consumer programs or uh, employee programs, you say, well, I'm just going to give people stuff, right? I'm just going to give them stuff. And the question is, you know, if I'm going to give them stuff, do this, does it actually work? Does, does giving rewards work? And the answer is sometimes, right? Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Well, when does it work? Well, it works. Um, here's the problems with it. We'll talk about what it works in a second. I have the slides to rearrange in the wrong order. But it doesn't work when, uh, if, you, if you have a problem with, when you remove the incentive, the motivation to do the thing disappears. I'm going to give you 50 bucks to come to this lecture, and next time I'm not going to give people 50 bucks, and so they don't show up. Uh, the rewards may not be large enough. If I'm only offering 50 cents, it, I don't think it's going to affect whether you come to this lecture or not. Um, and you have the problems of things that you see in behavioral economics with inflation. I make a deal with my kid, I give him five bucks for mowing the lawn, and the next time he wants six bucks or 10 bucks or 15. Um, so you have to be willing to take those things. And lastly, uh, money can decay over time. So if you're offering something over time, these things go away and they're less interesting to you. So far, so good? So if that's the case, and it sounds like it's all negative, when do you really want to use rewards like this? And the answer is when the type of performance you want to inspire on the, on the work side is non-creative, okay? Um, when it's purely tactical, I make widgets, I do something, then, then, then economic stuff works. Um, if a financial concern is a larger compensation, a larger issue in somebody's life, the lower the wage, giving them something that they may not already have is important to them. Um, you can see the other two. And, and when there's no sorts of intrinsic motivation. On the consumer side of this, think about Subway sandwiches or um, yogurts or something like that, right? There's nothing really they can tell you about you that makes it interesting uh, internally about yogurt, yogurt eating or, or sandwich eating. I'm, not the, I'm the world's greatest turkey and avocado sandwich eater. Nobody really cares. And in fact, I don't care. That's why they give you buy, buy nine, get one free. And in fact, you'll see other psychological tricks they'll use, like things of, with theory of endowed progress. You guys know that one? Theory of endowed progress is if I give you a card with 10 stamps on it and I click two, your chances of finishing that are more than if I gave you a stamp with eight cards and you start at zero, because you think I'm making progress. It's pretty cool. So if that's the case and tangible rewards only work sometimes on both consumer and, and employee kind of things, what should we do? Well, the answer is um, from these two professors known as Desi and Ryan, it's really um, self-determination theory. It's intrinsic motivation. And why do people do things? Again, that was my interest in starting the talk with you guys. And so let's, you know, there are a lot of TED Talks. If you go and look at these, like, you know, Dan Pink and different people talking about, you know, autonomy, mastering purpose, control, and getting better. They're all kind of the same thing. There are all these different models of it, but it's, I want to control what I want to do. I want to get better at stuff. I want to connect with people in my environment and feel that I'm part. And back to the evolutionary aspects of, of psychology, you know, we are pack animals. We, we don't, you know, the worst thing can happen is uh, you can be uh, ostracized by the group and your chances of survival are very low, right? So it's, it's I trace the water buffalo, you stay behind the rock and then you jump down and stab it in the head when it comes through, right? And so these things are all important. Relatedness is a very, very important thing and social connection is a very, very important uh, aspect of intrinsic motivation. So far so good? All right. So. Um, this is uh, just kind of a thing. This is just a story of intrinsic motivation of the stages that they go through, of someone who would go through. Um, the example I can think of is my daughter. Uh, my daughter is actually a very accomplished dancer. She's a junior in high school and getting ready to do what you guys do now. And um, at, when she was little, she would, she would sit there and mommy and daddy would tell her how beautiful she looked in her little tutu and she'd jump up and down and we'd tell her and she'd throw a show and we'd say, it's great. Pretty soon she was meeting with other little girls and she had the affinity. They all had dance team jackets. She would get a ribbon for the show. She'd get the new costume and things. And she started to identify. Pretty soon she gets to the stage where she sits there and you ask her now, she'll tell you she's a dancer. That is part of her identity. I dance. I choreograph, I dance, and I do these things. And actually now it's interesting. She's reached this point where She'll just go down in the garage, take some music, Spotify or Pandora or whatever, fire it up, and she just decides to choreograph something. Why? Because it feels good. She doesn't really know why. She just, it's what makes her happy. It's her bliss. And so the point is the more you can tap into that, into the, the feelings of your essence and connection and all these types of things, the more motivated you are and the happier you're going to be in life. 
So I, you know, so to that end, uh, this is a work-related thing, but so how does this apply to me and my job? So there's this um, guy I, I talk to occasionally out of Penn uh, named Neil Doshi, and he's a McKinsey guy. And basically what they've done is in their studies, they've actually looked at direct and indirect motives of motivation, of intrinsic motivation. And what they say is stuff on the left is good, stuff on the right is not so good. So more of the stuff on the left, less of the stuff on the right. So what do these things mean? Potential is your potential. It's the story of you, okay? The idea is that um, if you think about your job at work or your career at school, you're here because you're thinking about how, does, how am I gonna, I'm going to become better as a person. I'm going to Stanford. I'm studying whatever I'm studying. This is part of my, my life journey, and everything I'm doing is for that larger vision. That's called the axis of potential. And it's a good thing. And good gamification, good motivation design, things like that, revolve mostly around the axis of potential at this point in time. Um, well, things that are poor actually miss. They just give you a badge for a sense of a badge, and it doesn't mean anything, and that's why people think it's stupid. In terms of the next two levels, purpose is believing in something bigger than yourself. If you guys are all, I don't know, rallying for whoever you're rallying for, for the political campaign, if you're raising money for something for a good cause, that's, that's actually working on the axis of purpose. And then finally, there's something called play, and I want to be really clear about this, even though I'm a game guy, so it's ironic coming from me. Play is not play. It's not farting around in a game. Play is what is the creative aspect or the adaptive aspect of your job. Every job has something that has creativity in it. Yeah? And so um, when people are most happy, you'll hear the words flow a lot, like Mikhail Chesimihai, I can't pronounce his name very well. But, but flow, but the idea of like, I solved this problem in this really creative way. I did this thing in such a natural, cool way. Um, that's play. And that is actually the strongest in terms of motivations and why people stay. It goes top to bottom. Potential is not as strong as purpose, which is not as strong as play. And people will tough out situations when they're, when they're motivated by these kind of things at work. On the right side, they're pretty obvious. You're afraid you're going to lose, you know, your boss is leaning on you, your boss is screaming on you, that's emotional pressure. Um, it works in a negative way, but um, economic pressure is worse. I'm going to lose my job. What am I going to do? And then finally, inertia is the worst of all, believe it or not. I'm just sitting here. I don't really like it. I'm just going to blah, 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 but I'm here. Make sense? And it's kind of important to, to know these things because once you can figure out that kind of framework, you can kind of tap into what drives these things and then set up either digital or offline or even social kind of systems that, that help. And this is the fundamentals of how we work, right? So in terms of gamification, um, which I'm not, I know it's crazy. I'm not a big fan of the word because I think it, it's got mixed connotations. But it works by tapping into direct motivations of intrinsic things helps you self-actualize. And actually, this is what I, what I like. Um, you want to get nerdy. Um, this is a variant of one model out of Harvard called four drive theory. Um, but basically, uh, there's all sorts of ways to look at this. There are rewards of the tribe, rewards of the self, and the rewards of the hunt. I think that's near IL. There's a bunch of other things um, that are used. But in ours, this is one of the ways we look at it. So what we do is we try to figure out how do we make people successful. How do we make you? Because it's not about me, it's about you. It's about you, the user. So you hear everything about user-centric design? It's, it is. It's all about the people who are using your systems. So um, success, um, I beat you, you beat me. Um, also success at uh, making an achievement. You know, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, social value is either status or affiliation. Uh, structure is the removal of, um, of threat. It's actually kind of knowing I'm making progress and everything's going to be OK. It's actually used a lot in lower performance systems with like uh, uh, lower wage workers, you know, that kind of thing. And feeling smart, you'll see that a lot with engineers. It's less, it's less socially influenced, but I, I solved this algorithm, I got this patent, what have you. So far, so good? Um, so here's my two second homage to one of Byron's older students, BJ Fogg, which is, um, which is how do behaviors happen? So diving down, now that you kind of understand the motivational thing, diving down below, um, how do you trigger a behavior? And uh, I like his model. Um, it's you need a signal to the action. You need to be motivated to do it. And you need the ability to take that action. So the uh, phone rings. Uh, you, the, phone, the buzzing or the ring is the trigger. You look at it. That's your, you have the ability to answer. 
and your motivation is probably a thought in your head looked at who the number's from and whether you're going to answer it. If it's an 800 number, you ignore it. If it's your mom or dad or brother with something important, you probably say, excuse me, pick up the phone and go out of the room, right? So uh, this, was, this is his formula. Um, you can go look at behaviormodel.org um, or take his class. I think it, I don't know if he's teaching now, but, uh, but basically, if all those things align, something happens. If all those things are not aligned, they don't. And um, what's interesting about that is, you know, you, can, you know, one side of this thing is apathy and one side is frustration, depending on which, which it is. If you don't have a lot of motivation, it's there and you, you know, it's apathy. If your frustration is you really want, you're highly motivated, but you don't have the ability to change it. Um, happened to me during the Niners championship game. My cable went out. I called the guys. I started screaming on the phone and then they totally defanged me by saying, I'm sorry, Mr. Sims. Uh, we'll have a guy out on Wednesday to look at your box to see if it's like, that's not going to help me now. <laughs> So you get that that was in the ultimate of the frustration and inability curve. So um, basically, once you're able to trigger behaviors, you start to form loops where, you know, um, where people, there's a craving or a thought of an action. You take the action and there's a reward and an investment and the cycle goes over and over again. And um, what you have to realize, I guess, even before that is that Everything that you do, everything in life that you interact with, whether it's a video game or a digital system, has feedback and context. So, um, you know, you see all these things. What does a badge mean? What do points mean? What do, what's a notification? What's, an, what's a push notification on your iPhone mean when you get the little red thing? It's a notification and a feedback that something has occurred. So, in order to trigger behaviors and trigger interactions, you need feedback and you need context. And context is key just to your understanding of those things. Make sense? So, you know, am I advancing? Am I progressing? Does someone want to talk to me? What have you. Um, and in terms of context, anything you see in response to your behavior is a, is a feedback, is feedback loop. Um, typical what you would call game mechanics or things like that or these things, rewards, points, missions. And people, you would associate anything you see with this. Your update and status and frequency and airline miles. Your, um, your account balance on your credit card is feedback. Um, whether you, got, you entered things in to get your next classes for the next semester and they came back with something in email, that's feedback, right? And the context and how you perceive that is all part of the interaction interchange. So uh, some other just things to think about that usually come in interaction design, user paths. What is the experience? What's the UX? You know, you're designing for you. You're designing for the user of the system, not for the the company, you know, what is the path they take? What are the choices they make? What is the time domains those things are delivered on? All matter. Yeah. And, and removing friction. By the way, um, you'll hear a lot about motivation. You saw motivation and ability. Ability is much, uh, is much stronger than, than uh, motivation a lot of times. And that's why, if you think over the last 20 years, why there's been so much work on responsive design and web things. It's all that mo friction is harder. It's, it's a thing you can directly attack. So you can't even get to motivation if you can't figure out um, what, uh, what to do ability-wise. Sound, sound good? Interesting? OK. Sure. What to do ability-wise is like full of all kinds of topologies. What do you mean? Like, so like, can I get through the, uh, the yeah, so, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so can I get through the shopping cart in Amazon? In the phone example, it was could I even pick up the phone? Is the phone in another room? Um, it could be, uh, ability could be, do I understand what you're asking me to do? So if you think about the learning and education of a system, um, you know, best practices, I don't have this here, but best practices, you need to tell users what to do, how to do it, what do they get, why they should do it, right? Otherwise, the, you know, the um, kind of the covenant isn't set up. And uh, what's interesting is before you even can get into habits, you trigger behavior. When you first get approached with something, like even coming to, come to the seminar, right? There's a frequency utility calculation you're making. You look at my picture, you say, okay, short ball guy. You look at what the topic I'm talking about, and you make a decision on whether what I have to say for this thing is going to be worth it to you or not. That's the same thing with all life experiences. At first, before you've tried it, you're saying, ooh, chocolate ice cream, you know, that's how neuro, neuro, you know, neuroscience circus work, circuitry works, right? You, you decide whether you're going to do it. It triggers off a, a reward value of how much that is. And then it starts to reinforce with, I keep being honest here, with synapse connection over time that says, OK, chocolate ice cream is an eight. 
If you guys are vanilla, I apologize. I like chocolate better. Mm -hmm. So you know, you know, is you know, and then and then what happens is then you can start into the circuitry of habitualization and things like that. But so to the answer. Yeah, that's actually better. So okay, for okay, yeah, yeah. So so for instance, um, I have a buddy who worked on um, who was part of the Proteus Proteus thing. Do you guys know what Proteus is? I don't ever going off, but it's fine. Proteus is a pill that actually on Wi-Fi can detect whether you've taken the pill. The biggest problem that you have in um, in kind of reinforcement or any of these kind of loops is self-reporting. People are liars. Sorry, people lie all the time. And yeah, did you take that pill? Yeah, I took it. Did you take it between two of them? Yeah, sure I did. And the reality is, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. And the idea behind the Proteus pill was you, you took it and it gave you a Wi-Fi signal out to a pack on your hip and it told you you took it. And, you know, because it, it actually detects. So yeah, friction, if you can, that's, that's the easiest one. Now, it's creating a habit around that, making sure they're doing that so you get to that other point, it's a balance, but, but yeah. So far so good, is this helpful? All right. So a reward schedule, some more tricks, some more things. People respond to novelty. Um, you'll hear that over and over again. They respond to uh, the anticipation in your, circuit, in your neural circuitry. You're, you're anticipating reward. And in fact, if you look at someone like the old Skinner test, uh, keep me honest here, Byron, the old Skinner test where, you know, where the, 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 rat, the mouse is banging on the thing to avoid the shock or to get the pellet of food either way, it's when it's randomized things. Even they think that whatever they're doing is assigning it, but reality, it's the randomization that keeps it interesting. So when we design these systems, we, we design layers of do this, get that, but on top of it is a layer of randomization. That's actually what also what they do with slot machines. Because that's just the way the human brain is wired. So you can see variable ratio, fixed ratio, et cetera. Okay, um, here's some more tricks. Um, so power of small goals. When things are overwhelming, when you're designing your experience, try to break it down. I know you're, you're smart, but they're not as smart as you. Um, and they don't understand exactly what you're communicating. One of the biggest problems is people don't, people, on the, people who are trying to communicate don't understand how difficult it is to communicate, how difficult it is for the receiver to understand your communication. We cue in in so many different ways. Um, there's a great research thing, I think it happened here, um, of people tapping out songs, happy birthday, twinkle, twinkle, little star, whatever, and they would have two people sitting across from each other. One person would tap it, and the other person would try to guess. Anybody have an idea of how accurate the guesser was? Yeah? Only 5%. Yep, you're right. It's, it's, it's between 2.5% and 5%. So you think you're singing it in your head, and the reality is that um, they have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> so breaking things down into small, clear, precise goals is, is really important. And so here's just a joke, joke thing on the HR and our block guy. Hey, doing taxes is difficult too, or doing taxes for your parents are difficult, whichever is the case. And uh, so we'll just watch TV. The idea is if you can just get them to start with one thing, enter your name, maybe a little two, maybe a little three, and eventually you'll be done. And in fact, a different study, um, I can't remember where this was, I thought this was Arielli out of Duke, but it was uh, basically they ran a class, like a lecture like this, and they did three things. One was self-reporting with no tools. You know, I'll just do it on my own schedule. One is a forced schedule. And then once I gave you the tools to schedule, and you could set your own. And it turns out that in, in terms of completion, efficiency, and, and all that, the fourth schedule was best, the tools with the schedule were second, and I'll do it on my own, no problem was the worst. So again, to that end, designing a system that takes them through this thing, breaks it into small goals that they know how to do is a good thing. So um, this is just you know, breadcrumbing them along. Just, makes, you know, just remember, every step in the thing is a place where they could drop out. So at the same time, you're nudging them along. A, long, a lot of times you'll hear what words for our systems are called. They're called nudge systems, too. That's another terminology at Thaler out of Chicago. All right. So that's all the theory. So hopefully I didn't take too long. Let's, let's go quickly through secrets. Now you're going to design your own thing. You're going to be a designer. What do you do? And uh, here's the thing, secrets to success. You gotta have a plan. I'm gonna go quicker because I really I don't know how long this goes to, so I wanna make sure I cover as much as I can. So uh, number one, be smart. Um, there are a lot of things to fix in the world. Be focused. You know, MVP ideas not bad. Um, we did some stuff for um, a couple years ago for Home Shopping Network for HSN, and the idea is they have a lot of different goals. Is it converting women to their first purchase? Is it time to second purchase? Is it loyalty and engagement? And how often they're coming back to the site? Depending on your goal, you'll do something different. So make sure that you're focusing on the right thing. 
um, in terms of have a plan of how you're going to roll it out, in this case, both technically and um, behaviorally. So this is the interaction between UI, UX, and uh, psychology, and the tech below. Um, here's something really interesting. In terms of designing these systems for the enterprise, for employee systems, the business always has goals. The business will not buy this kind of product if it doesn't make money or return value. So you start out with business objectives like, you know, I'm going to get more posts, more reads, more sales, whatever it is. And then you go from the bottom up on what are the behaviors that are actually going. The fundamental atomic unit of what we do is behaviors. I voted, I read, I purchased, I watched, you know, you name it. I checked in, whatever it is. Um, and then you meet in the middle. Um, and to that end, your, your KPIs or the goals that you're driving to should be specific. Because without specificity, specificity, you can't look at the data and the cohorts and figure out what to change. People change all the time. The data changes all the time. It's a moving system. And the ability to monitor and close the feedback loop is what makes this stuff so special. It all kind of came out of the free to play stuff out of Korea and Japan and Facebook and, and, and Zynga and all this stuff. But it's all about we finally have the ability to record what people do, look at it in mass or in aggregate, and, um, and then decide what to do from there. So far, so good? Everybody? All right. So um, we do something that marketing, in, in, from our side, that marketing um, uh, companies do, marketing agencies a lot. We actually do persona analysis. So we do persona analysis. So if you think about it, people are motivated by different things, right? Those motivations lend to different types of mechanics or features or approaches. And then those approaches, the behaviors feed into those approaches and we monitor. So um, back to those four S's, success, social value, structure, and um, I'm missing one, smart. Uh, these guys have different profiles. A sales guy doesn't really care about being perceived as smart. He cares about his social status. Did you know what my W-2 was last year? And he, um, he cares about winning, bringing home money. Um, somebody who's an engineer may not be, care about that. They may care about the purity of their work and what they've designed, something like that. Um, call center workers may look at things like structure. Am I making progress? This job is such a grind. Oh, God, it's so hard. Look, at least I'm doing well. I'm doing better. Thank God. You know, they're going to recognize me. It's a validation system for what they're doing. So um, when you're designing these kind of things, it's important to understand the time windows that you're designing on, both from the recording of actions and the rewarding of actions. So um, in terms, if you're trying to build a habit, habit system that interacts with it, you would basically need a higher level of frequency of interaction. If it's less frequent or for shorter bursts, it's a different, it's a different approach. So, and, and the other thing is techno technology really affects context. Uh, we did a program, I think I have a web, website, so we powered, like, believe it or not, the National Rugby League in Australia, a team called the Melbourne Storm we power. And what happens is they have a combined loyalty program where you go and vote for your favorite athletes and watch videos and things like that, and then you go to the event, and it's actually tied. It does, you know, what you're doing there, mobile, web, and then actually in Australia, you don't pay with cash, you pay with the card that you get when you get your, your tickets. So last thing, um, when you're trying to figure out what are the levers for intrinsic motivation, the levers for behaviors, um, you have to figure out, hey, is there something I can hold my expertise? Can I make them feel smart? Can I validate their success? Or is it purely a participation play like a loyalty program, in which case it's about winning, that I win that TV that I entered in, like Publishers Clearinghouse or something like that? Are you trying to teach them in a prescriptive way? You know, do this, do this, do this, do this? Or can they, are you going to let them run with whatever they want? Um, solo versus social, always go social if you can because it doesn't cost any money and it influences the need to be part of the tribe, the need to be part of experiences, um, has a much bigger effect than doing things in a solo way. Um, if you think about with, with Ingmar here, the idea of the Folder Project where they were trying to understand genomes and understand different things by working together, the social power of it was much more effective than if you had asked one person to do something like that. And then finally, um, what I mean here by intrinsic and extrinsic really is intrinsic versus tangible. Because I mean, technically, giving them any kind of notification or prompt is extrinsic, but it doesn't have any monetary value. So that's the way I, that's the way most companies look at it, even though it's academically not correct. Um, so there's just an example: sales guy is motivated highly by success and social value. So you may do something like putting in career badges over his time and grade. You ever, if you 
worked in the, if you, when you get out and you, you work, you'll see there are things like President's Club for Top Salesmen or Top Salesmen of the Year. They break down their things into time windows for different goals. Career badges show lifetime value. Uh, quarterly things like President's Club is a thing for, uh, for that quarter, right? So there's different cadences that each job work on. And that example of career badges is an example of, uh, of a mechanic or a feature that would drive this kind of behavior for that type of persona. Make sense? No, yes? Okay. And so here's an example. So that's my partner in crime. He was a guy at uh, Zynga and played him. Um, if you ever played IMT Pain, that's him. <laughs> He's the guy who designed it. Um, so Tony, uh, basically here's an example of a community platform, kind of a typical Yammer, Yammer, Tibber, Chatter, Lithium, Jive, whatever, right? So the goal is to provide an employee tools to increase his workplace efficiency. So you may have something like onboarding tasks. Very simple, showing them what they need to do and what's the order of it, not too hard. You may have subtask lists that, that focus on obtainable goals, like something like user certification. Again, they need to know what they need to do in order to do it. Um, points and levels, anybody played Mario, any kind of things like that? Points are a, an illustration of generalized expertise. I can't tell exactly what you did. I can just tell you did a lot of it. So people who are good at cheating and things like that, it's a difference in like Angry Birds between getting points and getting three stars on every level. Two different things. One is your quest for perfection and playing something over and over. And I really dated myself with that old game. But um, play something new, I don't know. But <laughs> I, I'm not a big Angry Birds fan. It's just a good example. All right, um, expertise levels. What's interesting is um, we do a lot of work in what are called expertise track systems because the more ways you can validate people, the better off you are. These are validation systems. People care about recognition, they care about reputation, they care about validation and, personal, and everything in a personalized delivery system. And so uh, the idea of showing uh, something like this where I'm an expert in analytics or I'm an expert in something else, you'll see those things in systems that kind of know what they're doing if there's something to hang your expertise hat on. Here's an example of things you see like in Facebook or something else. You see notifications, you see alerts, you see find and follow. Um, we did this before they shifted. We were powering ask.com until they changed their paradigm. But um, all of this kind of stuff is another way to keep the conversation going. And then um, you can see different, different things. And finally, this is a concept of social proofing. You guys know social proof? Yes, no? Cialdini? Social proofing is if everybody else is doing it, I should do it too. So showing you activity streams where you're doing stuff means, you know, hey, you know, I'm doing it, you should do it too. Um, and then basically, you should have a plan to moder moder moderate these things and to watch them. So the biggest key to these kind of systems that you'll see out in the wild is that people change, like I said before, and it needs the system, you need to feed the beast. The system needs content. Either the content will be organic and self-generating, and if it's not, you need to program that content. So what happens when I launch one of these things, okay? Um, I can give you an example of a bunch of stuff we've, we've launched. Um, we did Samsung, there was something called Samsung Nation we ran for four years. And it was a loyalty program for Samsung. We, we did MTV in Canada, a bunch of different things. What happens is when you launch something, it looks like this. Yay team, you get some interest. Oh, there's something new on the site, I'm gonna do it. You know, uh, you know, the Onion has something new, Gawker has something new, whatever, whatever, whatever site you're, you frequent, you know, you put the, 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 the game or whatever the thing is going, get some novel spike. But it decays over time and it decays pretty quickly. It's pretty hard. If you do a really good job, you get a bigger spike. So if you've hit the right thing, you've used the right design mechanics, appealing to the right personas in the audience, you'll get a larger lift. But it will still decay. Why? People crave novelty. It's just like the, the best equivalent I can give you is this is like Showtime or HBO or Netflix. Not the content, but the platform. What happens if um, I'm HBO and Game of Thrones, everybody, I'm fired up for Game of Thrones. Everybody else fired up for Game of Thrones? No? Okay, I'm fired up, I'm a nerd, I get it. So I, I love Game of Thrones. But when Game of Thrones is over, I am gonna ditch HBO like a bad habit. I'm probably gonna Showtime, I'll go back to Netflix, Amazon maybe, because they don't have anything I want. I don't have, it's the same thing with these systems. 
if there's organic interest, if we're fighting about who's, who's the best, you know, who's gonna go in the draft on ESPN, or I, I like SureDog, which is a martial arts forum. If, if you're gonna talk about UFC stuff, people are going back and forth. There's stuff to always come and talk about. But if not, you need to program it. And that's, that's you know, regardless. So how do you do that? You basically, we call it the wave, but we basically look for key inflection points in the data where we can juice the program. If you think about, um, everybody's played some variant of some crappy social game, right? Yes? Okay. You ever notice like, oh, it's, it's BOGO Monday. Oh, it's, you know, find your, you know, flowers on Farmville. Oh, it's whatever, you know, God, it's so old. What, whatever they're playing, Clash of Clans, whatever, whatever it is, there's always some key inflection point where they're trying to juice it, either through promotion, feature rollout, extension, content, event, whatever it is. So there's a bunch of different things, but when you have these kind of systems and you're designing it, let's say you're all gonna go off and build your next, um, you know, Facebook, Insta, Snapchat, whatever variant, um, you know, you have to think, do I have organic content that's gonna generate in interest and velocity or is this gonna die? Because you, know, you can save yourself a lot of pain and money by figuring that out quick and then planning accordingly. So, uh, just remember to main, when you're maintaining these programs, you know, to do this kind of stuff, you have to watch this stuff. And then lastly, um, what I was going to show you was um, some use cases. And then we'll just take some questions or whatever. I don't know how much time and how fast I went. So um, here's an example in enterprise. Do you guys know who Booz Allen Hamilton is? Yes, no? Booz is a very, very large consulting firm. So there's Capgemini, there's Accenture, there's Deloitte, EY, Ernst & Young, PwC, and Booz. Booz does mostly government stuff. Here's an interesting problem that you're going to see in the workforce as you guys get out and you start doing stuff. Um, there's this concept um, of workforce fungibility or flexibility. There's a bunch of different names where you go out and you learn a job and then all of a sudden you're kind of, your skill set's old and outdated. I'm an engineer. I'm a JavaScript engineer, right? Or I'm a, this, look, I learned C. So I, I, I worked on Madden. I was a lead programmer on one of the Madden footballs. And I coded in C and C++, all right? Does anybody code in C or C++? No, I don't think so. Everything is Python and APIs and different, right? So what happens is these guys get old and out of date, men and women. So they said, what do we need? And we have this problem. We have all these engineers who are sitting around. They're not doing anything. And what can we do? Let's train them to be data scientists. Data science is really hot. You guys all want jobs? Go get a data science degree. Data science is really big right now. So what they did is they took in coursework from Stanford and a bunch of other places. They built a curricula. They built a forum, an innovation place, and a mentorship program, connected it all together, and then retrained all their workforce. So this thing is actually, um, this, I don't know if we're going to keep this on the final version. There's a link to the webinar that you can go look at. It's on our site. They actually talked about it. This thing was so successful, they've turned it from an inside thing to an outside practice. It's now a full functioning practice at Booz. And um, all these people who actually started the original program with us have been promoted, which is good for them. Um, but they've run four or five of these things. And the first one was to train data scientists. But you can use it for anything. So you think of workforce of the future. You want to know about workforce of the future, which is one of the media X opportunities. Workforce of, X, uh, of the future is going to be very flexible or has to be flexible. You have to keep moving from one thing to another. Now, going from brain surgeon to engineer may be hard. But going from one type of engineer to another type of engineer or an engineer to a product manager or a product manager to marketing may be within the realm of possibility. So, oh, I don't know what happened to my picture. Oh, there it is. So, um, you guys know Accenture? Yes, no? Accenture is one of the world's largest consulting firms. I don't know why I have a lot of consulting examples here. Um, basically, we power all of their internal, um, all 300,000 of them. And uh, they use this stuff for flash teaming. They use it for knowledge and silo expertise. Who's an expert? Who had last contact somewhere? Who can help me? And um, these types of systems um, allow them to work far, faster and smarter and better and help each other. You feel less like you're alone, and they're much more effective. I, I can't share the numbers with you. You can go look on the slide share if you want to see. Um, but highly successful. They've been a customer of ours for many, many years. Um, here's something interesting. Back to the Bill and Melinda Gates example. Um, we also power Royal Dutch Shell. Um, this is actually about cultural change. So if anybody cares about society and about causes and things like that, this is about how do you align people to a sense of purpose? How do you align people to a vision? In this case, Royal DSM grows by acquisition. They acquire a bunch of companies, and they want to get them on the same page about what the beliefs and the value systems are and things like that. This actually won some award, I don't remember, last, uh, last year. And then, um, oh, here we go. Oh, I have two Accentures, so I'm going to leave that, but I'm going to show you something cool. 
This is actually um, EMC. You know, as EMC, this got bought by Dell for a bunch of billion dollars. What this is actually is a mix of a partner, partner, customer, and employee community where they actually sell and help. And it turns out that um, when customers are engaged and they're actually working with the system and working with the customer, they tend to purchase a lot more stuff and be a lot more happy. Um, and so um, here is an example. This, the graphics here are pretty poor, I apologize, but this program has been running for five years and they don't feel they need to change it because they, even with our suggestion, because they keep, uh, they're doing fine. But basically, um, here's a social proofing element. It just shows you what people have done, what they've won, what their status is. Um, these are overall time saved, but they're interested in things like uh, who gave the most replies today, who started conversations this week, or even who's the all-time highest points. And then, again, points matter. Sometimes points matter or not. It's, a, it's an indicator of general expertise, not specific expertise. So for them, what we did is we actually rolled out this thing. Um, I'll see if I can find it. Uh, uh, called expertise categories, where they actually, as you comment and as you talk about things in different areas, there's a prescriptive, prescriptive way that you build expertise in that thing. Um, anybody who's technical here who goes to Stack Overflow, they have a different variant of kind of expertise systems. It's very um, shallow and broad in terms of knowing like bizarre coding questions that you answer, and you'll see that. Um, and then um, let's just see uh, what's really cool about this. I'm going to see if I can get to Tyler here. Um, what's really cool about this is actually this is a blended system of digital, mobile, and event. So EMC actually has badge scans. They track which courses you take. They track offline and online participation. And they use this with this concept that EMC calls, which is 360 degree touch. So they want to be in contact with their community or their people as many times as possible. And so there are all sorts of other ramifications. How spammy can I be? How often can I, you know, how much do they care? Uh, that's what the data is used for. So if you guys are designing or interested in doing consumer products, um, as you're talking to your customer base and your interaction, you know, you need to think of all those things, right? How much can I push? How much can I touch? Touch what's good, what's bad, et cetera. And uh, any of these things just show you examples of, you know, things you could do, um, things that are colored. He's obviously gotten things that are grayed out. He hasn't. Um, if I go back here, you can actually, if you think about back to Mario in the beginning of time, I do little actions, I jump, I hit mushrooms and stuff, I get points and I get behavior counts. Points can lead to levels, counts can lead to special awards, you know, unlocking the, uh, you know, the Wario car or whatever it is. That wouldn't happen in the same game, but you get the idea. Um, and so uh, these are just examples of something he may have done. Uh, this one's just pure participation, I want you to do these things. There are collections, there are tracks, there are all sorts of different approaches to the, to the journey, but in the end, uh, what people are, ha what's happening in these communities is they're building up a picture of who you are and what you are, both in the company and out of the company, and it becomes a way for you to show, you know, what you like, what you're good at, all this stuff, to the company and or outside. You'll start to see this, my, my guess is as a trend, to everything from like, boy, like startups like Degreed that are trying to catch all of your education all over the place. Um, Udacity, Udemy, who does certifications of what you're learning outside. Um, the way they publish things back and forth to LinkedIn. All those kind of things are, um, are happening. So, um, you know, good and bad. And then lastly, uh, just for fun, again, we're doing less and less consumer stuff now. Um, like I said at the beginning, we did a ton, a ton of everything from marketing campaigns to TV shows. Uh, these guys are in Australia, so I got to go to Australia for this, which was pretty cool. Um, this is actually a hybrid program with mobile pay. So it's mobile, event, and web, where people are encouraged to participate and follow their favorite fans. This is the National Rugby League, for anybody who likes rugby. Um, and uh, then they basically buy their ticket, and their be there's this concept we use of behavioral currency, behaviors as currency. How much is doing something mean to you? So if you think about it when you're running your business outside, um, if I can get somebody to join for free, I don't have to pay the $9 ad post somewhere to drive them in. I've gotten them for free, and I've reduced my blended acquisition cost. right? So. Same kind of idea here. They're rewarding people for their, their blend of, of actions and loyalty and spreading the good word about the, the storm. I don't know how well they did last year. At the, they're, they're, they're excited about this year. <laughs> so, Anyway, um, any questions? I, you know, I think I, did I overstay or understay? I don't know. But, uh, okay. 
Any questions? Does that all make sense? What do you guys want to know? Let's talk about your stuff instead of my stuff. Thank you.